The following is presented by CrewRoundTable.com Podcast Network. Join JR as he talks to friends, family, co-workers, man on the street, and perfect strangers to bring you their stories. This is JR Talks to People. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of JR Talks to People. I have with me today David Silverberg of the Toronto Poetry Slam. Thanks for having me. really appreciate it. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Uh, just, uh, just, I guess, just to lead off, what is the Toronto Poetry Slam? Sure. It's a 13-year-old spoken word competition that happens twice a month at Toronto's Drake Hotel, whereby poets perform their poems on stage and judges selected from the audience randomly score each poem between 0 to 10, basing their judgment both on content and performance. A team comes out of our season, much like in sports, and competes at international tournaments, uh, both in Canada and the U.S., against other Poetry Slam teams from across Canada and uh, the U.S. That's really cool. Uh, now, how does... If someone was interested in reading... Uh, and co- in competing, so it's it's a competition. Uh, how what kind of format does it take? Is uh, does the format does the competition sure. take? Sure. So the main thing most people need to know is that there's a time limit of three minutes and then ten seconds. Yes. And it was designed this way by the uh, inventor of Slam, Mark Smith, because he didn't like how some poetry shows he was going to in Chicago ran ten minutes long, twenty minutes long for one poem, and he got bored very easily, as did the audience. So we thought by forcing poets to edit their work to a fine kind of uh, uh, limit of 310, that would encourage better writing. And and it truly has. I, I can attest for myself. There's a lot of flabby words and text that I, that I cut out. We have other rules such as no costumes, no props, no musical instruments. Uh, you can beatbox. You can dance. You can, use, you can juggle if you want. As long as you don't use any... Uh, props that could accentuate your performance other than the microphone and the mic stand. But other than that, anything goes, any topic, any format. You can rap, you can do a prose poem, you can do regular poetry, uh, pretty much as long as it's your own work. Hey, that's cool, that's cool. And um, g- given that it's a, it's a reoccurring competition, how does one jump in on that? Is there a mm-hmm. weight given to previous competitors? Not at all, actually. Uh, that, that's actually why a lot of people like Poetry Slam, because it democratizes art in the sense that you don't have to be published, you don't have to know me or the other people from Toronto Poetry Project. You just sign up at 7.30 at the Drake Hotel, much like anyone else, whether they're a veteran or a rookie. And we've had poets as young as nine on the stage, because it is all ages, and as old as 85 years old on the stage. So a really wide range. And anyone can sign up as long as they have three poems in case they make it through all uh, three rounds. Cool, cool. Now, uh, oh, so it's a round kind of... um Kind of competition. How does that work? Right. So there's 12 posts in the first round, and then six in the second, based on the scores from the audience that are given from 0 to 10, you know, 8.5, 9.2, 6.1, and then there's three in the third. So at that last round, the top three poets battle it out, and whoever wins that round wins $80 and a spot in our semifinals in January. That is awesome. Um, you, you, you do go over the rules. And um, so is it always at the Drake Hotel? The Poetry Slam proper is at the Drake Hotel, but we do off-Drake events that are kind of specialized and themed. So much like you've been to our haiku head-to-head death match at yes. the uh, supermarket, as, as uh, you went to last year. That's in Kensington Market. We also do events such as the Love, Sex, and Heartbreak Slam, the Geek Slam, the Comedy Slam. And those are usually at Supermarket or May Cafe on Dundas Street West as well as we do workshops that are not at the Drake Hotel. So if anyone wants to learn about this whole spoken word thing and maybe they're intimidated by the talent they see on stage or poets like Shane Koizan, uh, they can you know, tap into their inner writer and come to our workshop, which are all pay what you can, uh, kind of on an ad hoc basis. We don't have a steady day or time that we do them all, all, uh, all throughout the year, but we do them once every two months or so. That's cool, that's cool. And uh, how many people, you, how, what's the attendance like at those uh, workshops? Workshops are pretty great. We've had up to 30 people 
I think at, at the most we've had as few as uh, eight or nine, but uh, it, it just the, the range is quite quite uh, impressive in terms of who comes out. It's people who I've never met before quite quite often, as opposed to friends or poets in the scene. People who've maybe been to one slam or never been to a slam before, but just want to try out this poetry thing. So it really is cool to see the range and as well as the big attendance at some of these workshops. Very interesting. Now you mentioned earlier the. Um, uh, poetry teams. That, yeah. That's really kind of interesting. <laughs> I've never heard of a poetry team. Exactly. Uh, how does mm-hmm. how does a team compete at poetry? Cause, so because your normal competition is just one person versus everybody right. else. Well, what's really cool about Poetry Slam these days, and spoken word in general, is that more poets are collaborating with other poets in ways that are really astounding. And it takes kind of the loneliness out of being a writer and a creative writer because you are working with another poet to create a team piece. And a group piece or team piece is a poem written by more than one person or perhaps by one person but performed by multiple people on stage. So we've had dozens of team pieces throughout um, the Toronto Poetry Slam team history on topics ranging from relationships to social injustice to uh, um, famine in third world countries and it's been quite a ride to see how our coaches, yes we do even have a coach, works with the team to ensure that their team pieces are tightly written, well performed and that the rhythm is in concert with the great writing. So much like a team piece in breakdancing, which I've seen also quite a lot, uh, team pieces in poetry is gaining a lot of favor because it allows people to stretch their creativity, work with other poets, and not feel like this poetry thing has to be just you solo in your, in your room writing. Really cool. Uh, so, how f- is it? Is it are these uh, are these competitions just in North America? Or does the team travel outside of U.S. and Canada? The team doesn't travel outside North America because the main ones we compete at are in North America, and the biggest one is in the U.S. The National Poetry Slam, which we just came back from in Denver in early August. There, are, there is something called the World Poetry Slam in Paris every year, but that's an individual competition. Okay. And the winner of the Vancouver Individual World Poetry Slam goes on to compete at that World Poetry Slam. So hopefully that's not too confusing of a sentence. But Vancouver holds the competition with all Canadian individual poets. And whoever wins that slam uh, from all over Canada, Canadian poets come, uh, will represent Canada in Paris. And so, actually, uh, uh, one of our poets, Toronto Poetry Slam's Ifra Hussein, will be representing Canada in Paris in 2018. Now, uh, like other competitive events, is, is there corporate sponsorship, sponsorship uh, of the individuals or just the... Uh, no, you know what? what? Companies have been slow to gravitate towards spoken word, for better or worse. Some people like the idea that we're still underground and not getting known by the Nikes and TDs of the world so that our slams aren't sponsored and beholden, perhaps, to these sponsors. Others believe that it's time for spoken word and poetry to go the way of music and theater and film and to get corporate sponsorship in order for it to elevate higher into the public consciousness, for it to get some funding for poets who've been uh, working for, you know, $150 gigs there, $150 gigs here. So there's a bit of a tension within the community of where corporate sponsorship would fit and how it would still retain the um, independence of why people like spoken word. I can see I can see the, uh, the concern there because mm-hmm. with... With corporate sponsorship, then comes subjects you can't talk about. Exactly. You can't criticize your sponsor. (laughs) Primarily, you can't criticize the sponsor. So if you have a... If you have a poet, poem about uh, against the banks, yeah. TD's not going to like that, just for, exa- just, just for example. So I, I can kind of see that side of the argument. I think if we ever do, took corporate sponsorship, we'd have to have it very laid out in a contract that there should be no censorship of what we perform at any moment because that is the ethos of Poetry Slam in general, is that there's no censorship. And the audience can boo something they don't like. Like, we allow clapping and applauding, but we also say at the beginning of the show... Poets shouldn't be getting off scot-free if they if they say something racist, yeah. sexist, any of the ists, uh, something that you find um, uh, controversially uh, abhorrent in, in your point of view, not just if it's poor writing, uh, which they do in Chicago, that's a whole other story, mm-hmm. they stomp their feet for bad metaphors and bad similes, but in Toronto we do encourage people to not let poets get off with um, you know sexism and racism, and I don't know if a corporate sponsor would 
even want that kind of content on stage. Although at a poach slam, we just never know what will be on stage until the night of. How is that? How is that policed in a competition that someone goes up, reads, reads fairly unacceptable, mm-hmm. or not simply that it's that it's tr- because of troubling content, but they're using pretty uh, derogatory language. What what is actually done? To penalize that person. Well, that's all up to the judges. So there's five judges who get to get to decide if that poet is going to be penalized for their statements or whether they agree with their statements. And that is, they, they could be influenced by the audience. There could be booing. There could be hissing. But the audience can't kick out a poet. The slam master can't really kick out a poet. Maybe if there was something really abusive towards another individual, perhaps. But if it's generally... Uh, offensive to a certain race or a culture or uh, gender, then the judges should kind of act accordingly. And they likely will, because there's just not a lot of tolerance for that kind of hate speech at a poetry slam. It's not uh, the right kind of audience to, to preach that to. It's not the an, an alt-right or white nationalist event at, uh, at the Drake Hotel, definitely. So a lot of um, right-leaning poets don't find a lot of favor in the slams scene which is uh, you know branching off to another topic of of you know where maybe those poets would find any favor at their own events or perhaps at rallies i'm not sure okay okay you know are you are you seeing that kind of a uh, kind of thing on an upswing these days not to go too far out of the, out no of no no not, not not at all i think a lot of poets or writers realize that they have those views that lean more to, let's say to the alt-right um they're just not going to be getting any love at chana poetry slam so i think people know their audience and they know that our audience is definitely more inclusive and more open to let's say you know let's say gender non-binary poets as well and uh social justice talk uh topics so i think those kinds of poets who lean a little bit more to the right just don't even show up okay very cool so i was on your uh your website now you said you have you have poets uh as uh, as young as nine but i also saw that you have a uh uh program called BAM? Yes, BAM is great. BAM is our um, youth slam that's only for poets um, under 19. It's been going on for, oh gosh, like eight years or so, and it's out of the Maid Cafe on Dundas Street West on the second Wednesday of every month. And we started that a while ago, thanks to Yehuda Fisher, shout out there, because we believe that so many people were coming to our slams of the Drake, and they were youth, that it can be a bit of an intimidating stage. Uh, the Drake Hotel, for those who don't know, is a pretty big venue. 200 people can fit in there. It's, it's classy. It's nice. It's Queen West. Um, but for someone who's never been on stage before, it, it could be a little nerve-wracking. So the BAM scene was created to give poets their own space, to have them collaborate with each other, to learn from each other, in a space that was just for them. And we just saw a huge upswell in a lot of youth coming out to that event. Uh, especially since we do a lot of work in schools during the school year. We, do, we run workshops in schools uh, the, via Toronto Poetry Project. And we just didn't want to tell people you, your only option is come to the Drake Hotel, even though it is all ages for us, thanks to the Drake's awesome management. And we wanted to let them know, hey, there's this place where you can come at 6 o'clock. It ends at 8 o'clock. Uh, so parents can, can take their kids and not feel like it's going to be a late night. And it's been a wild ride to see how many youth from all over Ontario, not just the GTA, have been coming out to that. Awesome, awesome. Um, very cool. Uh, so I understand you brought some of your own poetry to uh, just to give us a taste of... Uh, sure. Just expand our, uh, our, our worldview here. I brought a couple there. poems, actually. Um, I thought I would do uh, one short one and one medium-length one, okay. if, if you're interested. And this will be actually out of my new collection that I wanted to promote. It's going to be a book of sci-fi, fantasy, and horror, and spec fiction kind of poetry. Something I've always been interested in reading. I love reading uh, sci-fi and fantasy and horror, but I've never really taken a lot of time to focus on it as a poet. And a fantastic poet named Sandra Castorian, publisher, decided to give me a book deal that'll be out in 2018 uh, via her her imprint called uh, Chising. And so I thought I would read a couple from there. Okay, great. Floor's yours. Thanks. This one is called Burn. When the world burned, we were kissing each other's clavicles. It came fast and heavy, like the tornado of fire. We closed our eyes and let the heat shudder over our curled bodies. 
It was the closest we've been for seven months. And we stayed that way, long after the rubble was excavated, long after the sifters tasted the last grumble of dirt. Our bones became trophies of raised fist triumph, her hands still on my hips. This next poem is dedicated to anyone like me who loves horror movies. One, two, Freddy's coming for you. Three, four, better lock your door. Five, six, grab your crucifix. Seven, eight, gonna stay up late. Nine, ten, never sleep. Again, I'm watching horror movies for self-help tips. It started with Freddy Krueger. And these days, I can't really even meet a Freddy without thinking of a red and black checkered shirt and kill phrases such as, How sweet, fresh meat. The rhymes, jokes, and puns stabbed me so quickly I barely noticed any blood. I was smirking at Freddy's hypercolored punchlines, just silly nightmares I could flick away no harm. Krugs didn't keep me up at night, but instead taught me to grasp the humor in everything, in tragedy, in pain, in the darkness that gift wraps our dreams every night. And that was only the beginning, because Jason taught me the stoic stealth of silent determination. Carrie bled the blood of a daughter who finally saw how wrong her mom could be. The Shining told me, yeah, I'll work a no play makes everyone a dull boy. And with the ring, I realized wet well children are creepy as fuck. I zip car at a drive-in to catch a double bill of it and stand by me, a one-two punch of kids being kids for the sake of being kids. These days, I'm going through the back catalog like a hipster hunkers down with Dan Savage. Chucky tells me I'm never too small to make a difference. Hellraiser's pinhead scrubs the vanilla out of me so I get a bit more Neapolitan. The werewolves and howling remind me to let loose once in a while. And Michael Myers gives me a good reason to never hold grudges. It's not just the slashers I'm watching for advice. Every wide-eyed victim billboards the bravery of the foolish, a new angle of admirable. They got moxie, as my grandfather would say. Thing is, they just suck at escaping, which we all do sometimes. Then there's the plucky hero heroin creepy kid. They trip the monster with piano wire way before Home Alone did it. Their training to fight the beast montage can inspire any nerdy kid to piss on the ghosts that haunt them. It's all so shiny, so rah-rah, sis boom ba. But I gave up on horror's believability like Mulder gave up on making a move on Scully in season one. It's the anticipation of what could be that tickles the veins so deeply. So lather me with the gore and the roller coaster screams, the ultra violence and the eyes dilated with momentary courage. This is what gives me hope that anyone can be a boomstick among twigs. You might think it's oddball to find inspiration in monsters with bloody hockey masks. Thing is, horror isn't designed to create fear, it's made to release it. Wow, well, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for coming, David. So just, just mm. It's been uh, a pleasure. If, uh, if anyone wanted to lo- learn more about the Toronto Poetry Slam, how would they, where would they find out? We're all over the web. We don't do flyers anymore. Uh, TorontoPoetrySlam.com. We're on Twitter, at T.O. Poetry Slam. On Facebook, Toronto Poetry Slam News and Shows. And finally, Instagram, Toronto Poetry Slam, all uh, one word. Thank you. And if they wanted to, is there anything where they can do to find out about more about your collection that's... Uh, right. So my collection is going to be coming out with Chizine, C-H-I-Z-I-N-E, which is a great publisher that people should be following anyway for fantastic fiction in Canada. And that'll be out in 2018, when I'm not sure, but I'll definitely try to promote um, it on my own website, which is davidsilverberg.ca. And I would be remiss not to mention the next Toronto Poetry Slam, which would be August 27th at the Drake Hotel, but if people can't make out that one, we're soon back at the Drake in September, September 2nd, featuring Javon Johnson from San Diego, California, and he is amazing if you've never heard of him before. Well, that's wonderful. Uh, I will. All those uh, links will also be in the show notes and on the website, so uh, the listeners don't have to be uh, viciously scribbling away right now, but I will, <laughs> have, will have the links up uh, when, the, when the show posts. Well, thanks for stopping by, David. Appreciate it. I look forward to your future episodes. And I look forward to uh, hopefully attending a, another, another Toronto Poetry Slam in the future. You're more than welcome. Thank you. 
Thank you for listening to this episode of JR Talks to People. Our opening and closing music was provided by bensound.com. Subscribe to the Crew Roundtable podcast here on iTunes, Google Play, or visit crewroundtable.com to listen online. Remember, subscribing not only gets you access to this podcast, but also Hot Takes with Gino and the parent podcast, Crew Roundtable. If you enjoyed this podcast or any others on the Crew Roundtable Network, please take time to rate and review us on iTunes. Once again, thank you for listening, and I'll talk to you again next time.